Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Bunatu, Sahaviryan Karawa Vade, Justina Vadi, Tamasu, Vidisha Vade, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. So we were saying last week that the uh, the Pandavas' success was seen by Duryodhana. So Duryodhana saw that the Pandavas were successful in what they did. And despite them having basically nothing to start out with, they still used their resources uh, to build something very successful from scratch. And what happened was Duryodhana, upon the full re realization of this, of how popular they became, how quickly they became popular, he thought, how is this possible, right? So all of the attention was now going back onto the Pandavas. And so Duryodhana felt ignored. He felt abandoned. So this again triggered a lot of these insecurities inwards. And these insecurities is what we call expresses itself in a form of very common is jealousy. So Duryodhana experienced this like I am small, I am unworthy, and they're getting all of the attention, all of the success, and I'm not. So the fastest way to resolve this is by basically finding something and going, well, here's a flaw about them, and then we put them down. So this is uh, how the mechanism of jealousy works, because it's the fastest way to actually put oneself, to make oneself feel good again, uh, because one cannot stand their, their mind's agitations. So... Now, most of us, how do, just when I want to say most of us, like whoever it is, it doesn't matter. I'm not you know, looking at anyone saying like you, you do. Just most of us generally, when we experience this insecurity or jealousy, the way we deal with it is we hold it inwards. In other words, we contain it within. And now this transforms into various psychological triggers. And then eventually we have to express it somewhere. And eventually it either gets expressed somewhere that is completely unrelated to the original event, but it's actually tied back, traced back to that jealousy that was withheld because of something else. Um, so what we do is we hold it in. So this is at least one step better than what Duryodhana has done. So what Duryodhana done is he couldn't hold it in. His way to, to cope with this jealousy was to try to literally eliminate the Pandavas because he recognized the Pandavas as an object which was creating this insecurity. In other words, the jealousy causes the person to think that, that object, the existence of that object is the, the very cause of my insecurity. But that insecurity actually has nothing to do with that object because the moment that object is gone, some other object is going to trigger the same emotion. So Duryodhana made that mistake by thinking that it's out there. So he wanted to destroy that. This is very common in sports, like, you know, two teams look, looking at each other from a you know, World Cup. And if you've watched the World Cup, right, or any cricket in India, then what happens when one team scores? They celebrate. Now, how does the other team feel? Do they, uh, do they, they celebrate also? No. They, they feel like, oh, no. That's like, oh, no, you know. Not, not working. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's okay. We'll score soon enough. In other words, there's this unhappiness. In other words, they cannot contain it. And sometimes it comes up as criticism, like boo, you know. So we find this uh, cr critical phase or critical component in the other to put them down so that we can feel good. So this is the mechanism of jealousy. And it's very hard to eliminate, actually. It's much easier to speak about. But in real life, it's, uh, it's very intricate and comes out in a subtle fashion. And then we ask the question, what is jealousy? Uh, because we want to get to know it. See, before I answer that, the question is, the, the question will now be, why are we speaking about this? What's the point? The answer is just mentioning these psychological components that are in us in itself is enough to not fall for them anymore. So it's not about really just saying what to do and what not to do but rather just acknowledging the presence of them. And through that acknowledgement, then you can catch yourself and say, ah, I'm catching myself doing this. And then we stop ourselves. That's why we're mentioning these things out loud. 
So again, what is jealousy? We said it is inadequacy. In other words, I am not happy with the way that I am. I'm not happy about my physical, my mental, my life, my achievements, at least not happy if I contrast with someone else's achievements and uh, their, their success and their knowledge and their way of speaking and their way of singing and their way of music, their way of art, their way of uh, communicating, their, how many friends, you know, today it's, it's basically, you know, if you look at the importance is attributed to how many followers you have on Facebook. Right? It's like, I've got a million followers. So it becomes a big deal. And as someone else is go, mm, you know, they got a million followers, they only got 20,000. So this again triggers that digital jealousy. So whether it's digital or physical, it's still jealousy either way. And uh, in Sanskrit, this jealousy, um, there's a word for it. It is uh, amarsha. Amarsha, amarsha means uh, intolerance. In other words, I am unwilling to tolerate another's rightfully deserved success. I'm unwilling to acknowledge that they took all of that hard work to become what they are, hard work to be in their rightfully deserved position. I'm unwilling to stop and actually even ask what made them be to where they are and how can I get inspired by that? So we miss that step and because we miss it, the natural emotion is I'm not happy about them being up there and me being down here. So in other words, we miss the opportunity to grow when we buy into this jealousy. So this means that jealousy can be used as an incredible learning tool for development if it arises and then we ask, what is it in me that is so insecure that it has to feel so small in contrast to this other and cannot even appreciate it? Knowing fully that there is actually no essential difference between me and them. They were given the same resources. I was given the same resources. We have the same air to breathe. We have the same water to drink, and yet I cannot accept their success. Now, the other component of jealousy is, if you notice, this is only jealousy presents itself in a field, in the same field. For example, an artist cannot be jealous of someone who sings well, or a singer cannot be jealous of a person who is great in soccer. It's usually in that same field, like two soccer teams, two artists, even two teachers, even um, it even becomes a problem with, you know, Swami cannot accept another Swami. Uh, so as I said, it's a very subtle and it's difficult to eliminate. And it's probably the last thing that a person eliminates mm -hmm. in their life because it comes out in so many small ways, but it has to be eliminated um, through like asking, well, what is it, you know, what is it, how can I appreciate what they actually did? And, and how can I uh, see them in the light to, to, to inspire me? So we have to engage in this self inquiry to get this, this uh, seed of jealousy out. And jealousy, as we also said, we can't stand it. So the fastest way, because why, why can we not stand it? Because when there's jealousy, our minds are agitated. And when the mind is agitated, then the person resorts to a method to get rid of that agitation in the fastest way possible. This is called the path of least resistance. And what is the path of least resistance to eliminate mental agitation? Is it to go over and say, and talk to them and say, you know, what made you where you are today? Um, to, because that's effort, isn't it? Yeah, so the least resistance is to remain exactly where I am and just use my thoughts and go and find some critical component about them, something to criticize them and say, nah, they're not, you know, they're just a fake, they're a fraud, they're a scammer, right? Very quickly, one second done. And what does this do? It makes the person feel good about themselves. So this is called the path of least resistance. Doing actions only for my sake that is completely misaligned with reality. It has no basis in reality. So it becomes all about myself. Um, and there is a, um, there is a person, uh, Bharat Bharatrahari Bharat wrote a, it's just a person, 
is like a Lao Tzu in Sanskrit. He wrote a, uh, um, a 300 poems. It's called uh, Shataka Traya. Shataka Traya. In other words, Traya means three. Shataka means 100. So one, so 300 poems or 300 noble verses. In South India, it's called uh, Subhashitam uh, Trishati. In other words, uh, 300 aphorisms. And he said something very interesting. I picked this one specifically because it, I, I liked it because it was relating to this. He said, uh, para guna, uh, para manun, uh, parvati kritya nityam. In other words, para guna. So big, para, what is para? Uh, big, so big qualities. Para manun is uh, the smallest, atomic. And then uh, nityam always parvati uh, kritya turns into a mountain. So a noble person always turns the big, the, the, the smallest good qualities into as though looking through a magnifying glass and seeing a big mountain in them. Whereas what does a non-noble person do? He looks through a magnifying glass and turns unpleasant qualities as though looking through a magnifying glass and looks at a big mountain. So this is the difference between a noble person and an ignoble, or per, let's not even call him an ignoble person. We'll call him a person that is yet to become noble. In other words, a noble person is able to find and always nityam turns the smallest good qualities into as though looking at a mountain. Now, for those of you who have taken a tour like Himalaya or something, is it, is it, do you find it possible to ignore a mountain? No. No, it is so in front of your face, you cannot not see the mountain. In other words, for a noble person, when a, when a person looks at another, you, you find some quality about them. Now, we're trained to see the small qualities. So this means it requires effort on the part of us to find something to, that we can compliment them about, that we can see something through them, like the effort they put that makes them to be where they are. So see, this is why I say it's very easy to talk about the vision of oneness, how there is no essential difference between Jiva, Jagat, and Ishwara. But it's a totally different story to actually, in real life, see this mitya world, this world of appearances, this world of uh, apparent, into not different from satyam. We said this before in the Gita, wherever there is mitya, that's exactly where there is satyam. We cannot put mitya over there and say, I alone am satyam. And because that's the case, I have the right to put mitya down. So it doesn't work like that. We need objective vision. And how to start with this objective vision? By discovering these small good qualities and as though looking through a magnifying glass, turning into a big mountain. Because the point is we've been trained culturally, socially, psychologically, parentally to always nityam find the qualities that put others down. And this actually, if you think about it, doesn't allow others to grow right? because they're always reminded of those qualities which, which are actually holding others back. So we're not doing others a favor by constantly reminding them and saying, oh, you always do this. Oh, you won't get it. You haven't got it before, now you won't get it now. So that's it's actually unfair because the person needs encouragement and this is our duty. All right. And the question is, why is this jealousy so hard to eliminate? Because this I am identity is entangled in the mind's narrative of insecurity. So this insecurity is running in the mind. Why I'm not good enough. Why I am not competent enough. Why I can't. Why I won't succeed. Why, um, you know, why nobody likes me. Why I am not attractive. Why? So it keeps on going with these why questions and it creates a narrative around it. And, this, uh, and then the I am buys into this narrative and through this repetition, it's like, you know, Pavlov's dogs. Every time there's this, uh, you know, narrative going on, you say, yep, that's me, right? 
And to feel good, then we find something to, to put someone down. And other ways that we put others, other people down is like this. You know, I'm so lucky to be here. Yeah, it could be much worse than now. I could be in Africa. I could be, uh, um, I could be you know, in a position. I could not have a job. In other words, again, these are subtle methods to make us feel good by in a means of contrasting the unlucky versus me lucky. So in other words, I, what am I doing? I'm making myself feel good at the expense of, through my mind, reinforcing that narrative and putting others down, right? So in order to feel good. And to feel good implies what? The narrative is true. So this is how we trick ourselves. And we have to get out of this pattern because it is that pattern which produces ongoing suffering in, in one way or the other. If not today, then tomorrow. If not tomorrow, then 10 years from now, right? Okay. Now, uh, in Sanskrit, there's a word, I mentioned this before in the Gita, manushya. Manushya just means thinking being, okay? So when we say man, I'm not going to use the word man because in English, the word man has been probably diluted as much as the word God has been. So I'm going to use manushya. Manushya means that being who has the capacity and not only has it, but exercises that capacity to think. So therefore, to be considered a true manushya, a man, what does this mean? I use my capacity to think. But what does this jealousy do? It, can, it makes a conclusion and it puts a full stop. It doesn't think further after concluding that that's how it is. So therefore, a human being's responsibility lies in thinking before making a conclusion and then saying that's how it is. Because then life becomes about assumptions. It becomes about making these narratives and then saying that's the way it is, full stop. Whereas that is not what a minutia does. Minutia constantly keeps an open mind inquiring into the nature of this reality. In other words, it keeps the mind active constantly. Okay. And Manushya also is, because of this self-inquiry, is the one who resolves this self-inadequacy by constantly asking questions and looking into oneself. That is our duty. For example, I think Thomas said in last session or this two sessions before, this um, word of self-growth. So this is a perfect example where this self-growth comes into play now. So it's not just, you know, as I said, Satya Mit, it's all Mitya now. There is a level of self-growth, looking into ourselves. Why? Because some skaras keep coming, keep going, throwing these old conditions into our present now. And then we you know, feel compelled to play out this, this condition. So we have to stop it. We have to intercept it as it arises in response to the environmental trigger. That's our duty as a manushya. Okay. And so this means manushya has the capacity to admire other people's shining qualities. Not criticize, admire. Okay, that's called freedom. See, there is no freedom because what does moksha mean? Moksha means freedom. Now, how is a person supposed to be free if there's a constant need to right, reduce, reduce the world? That's not freedom, that's bondage, right? So this means there is a stage before the full knowledge can take place, before the person can be truly free from these conditions. That requires lots and lots of work constantly. Why? Because you're a manusha, a thinking being, the one who thinks. Now, the next question was, how do you handle if someone is jealous towards you? Okay, so how do we handle that? First of all, often what happens is sometimes we provoke the other to be jealous by ourselves exaggerating our talents and accomplishments. In other words, we do not show our humanness. We do not show our vulnerabilities. In other words, we project ourselves as this big person who is invincible, who knows it all, who says, I don't care. 
It's all mitya, right? I'm free. Now, suppose I said to you, I actually don't care what you think about me. Would that bring, bring you closer? Would, that, would I relate to you or would that kind of distance you away from me? If I said to you, I actually don't care what you think. I'm just you know, doing my duty and that's it. You know the answer to that already, right? So no one in this world can truly say, unless there's some distortions going on, I don't care what you think. Every person cares about an, another's opinion. That's just the reality. Even a nyani cannot say now a nyani is you know, so free and is up, you know, is totally detached. All of these ideas, these one-liners, are put in the society and they're just projected, and then we make it into a big reality. The reality is there is a human being, and we're not getting away from that human being because the human being is alive. And this human being needs to relate to other human beings. So there is no space for saying, I don't care, and I know it all, and I am invincible, and, and so on, right? Because that just creates anger on the other side or potential jealousy. Why? Because I am the one who's projecting an image that is so big that naturally invites other people's criticism. So that's just the way it is in the human society. You're up there, naturally, we want to put out, you know, put others down. That's just the way it is. So what do we do? We don't project these ideas. We don't exaggerate our accomplishments. In other words, um, we share our vulnerabilities. Even in the statistics, you know, there's a lot of studies done about this. We like those who share their weaknesses, who share their vulnerabilities. We actually like those people because this is totally contrary to what most of us have been taught. Show your bright side, show how successful you are, show how clever you are, you know, be, every, be word for word perfect. Just, you know, it, it express the Sanskrit from beginning to the end and, and give people an impression how good of a speaker you are. So all of these things, and even in jobs, you know, show how you know, committed I am, what a good person I am. All of this invites these attacks. So this means we have to become real. What does being real mean? Down to earth. The fact is nobody in this world has it perfect. No one is, you know, is... is um, See, even the avatars in our Vedic scriptures, are they portrayed as someone who's sitting there constantly smiling, completely without any problems? Are they? Rama, Krishna. Look at Krishna. How many, how many duties he had to attend to? He had conflicts with brother, Bauram, right? Uh, with, in, his whole, in, in his own district, there was some, you know, there was some conflicts there had to constantly attend to the Pandavas and you know, deal with Duryodhana. Rama also had to go after you know, Sita. So tell me one person who's got it all beautiful as, as it's portrayed in, this, you know, in, these, uh, in these false images. Nobody. So this is what we mean. Human being means the one who is constantly, uh, has to be real, down to earth. And when I say real, I mean sharing one's vulnerabilities, weaknesses, but not just sharing them, in the name of you know, trying to appear vulnerable. This is another problem that arises. So what I mean by this is uh, in chapter 13, there are, there's 20 qualities that Krishna will talk about in the Bhagavad Gita. And one of them is manitwam. Now manitwam is exaggerating one's accomplishments. This is called excessive pride. Why? for the sake of gaining validation so that I can feel good about myself. So what is manitwa? For example, you have a certain position. Now, when someone asks you, what do you do? You do tell them the truth of your position, but then we, ex we make it bigger than in real life to give an impression that we're more successful than we actually are. And we know, we know, we're, we're, we know we're doing this, but we still go ahead and give this, even if we imply it, we still make it bigger than it actually is. So we're not talking about being vulnerable in a sense of money to, oh, you know, let me tell you about my problems so that you can like me. Another is, so in chapter 13, we're going to talk about these 20 qualities. Uh, and one of them is amanitwa. That means uh, absence of excessive pride, highly crucial. 
The other one is Dambha. Now, Dambha is also giving a false image, but unlike in Manitwa, Dambha is creating a false, a fabricating a false image about yourself. That means completely not having any position in real life, but creating it or living in that lie and then sharing it to the society because it is guaranteed to, you know, get that, 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 wow, really? And that what happens, it makes us then feel good. So Manitwa, exaggerating and Damha, fabricating a false image by adding a narrative that, that in Dashi doesn't exist at all. So we're not talking about sharing vulnerabilities or being real in, in a form of Manitwa and Dambha. Okay, for example, uh, what is Dambha? A person who dresses expensive, but in real life, they got bill collectors you know, going after him. So there's an incongruency between who I am and what is actually the case? What is actually the reality in my life? There's an incongruency there. So because there's an incongruency of who I am and what image I portray to the world, what's the result of that? Jealousy. So this, is me, this means there's a negligence on our part on creating this inconsistency. Another example is in scholars, even in the data happens, you know, I am smarter than I actually am. So we, you know, put out these lines in Sanskrit in a, and use all these narratives, these, you know, stories just to give this image that we're, you know, somehow versed or we're, you know, we're, we're educated. So again, this comes out in these subtle forms. Okay. Now, none of these, nor, not Dhamma, nor Manitwa, the, which is in chapter 13, which we'll talk about more extensively. None of them were the case in the Pandavas situation because the Pandavas were not showing off. They were not fabricating their position. They were completely honest. So what do we do in the Pandava situation? There's a backup plan. Now, I'm not saying that the backup plan is supposed to work. See, again, don't look at this in black or white. Whatever I say can be easily negated from a different point of view. We understand that. We're only having a discussion for opening up our minds to adding more possibilities. But in terms of the absolute solution, we cannot speak in this black or white because it, the world does not work like that. It's not like don't share your vulnerabilities and that's guaranteed success not to have any jealousy. Still, someone will be jealous, right? So it's just a, a way of discussion of possibilities. If jealousy is affecting our life, that's when we need to set boundaries. For example, the Pandavas were not doing anything that is adharmic to the Kauravas, but still Duryodhana tried to form plots to eliminate them. And this was affecting the Pandavas like in real life. They couldn't get away with it. Even if they you know, thought, oh, it's okay, we shouldn't think bad of Duryodhana. Duryodhana was actually physically causing damage. It's like someone you know, doesn't like you, they burn your car, right? So, or, or for example, someone doesn't like you and then they go and tell their boss a story that is clearly twisted and it's meant to make you fired, meant to get you out of the job. That's also a possibility. I mean, it's forming plots. It happens all the time in real life. So this is when we need to set firm boundaries. So you can't just say now it's their problem because in this case, you know, boundaries is required. Now, what is setting firm boundaries? It is whereby you actually make a confrontation. Because the thing is, we even have statistics about this. Uh, when those Air Force fighters in, uh, during uh, wars, they will, they will even say this, it is much easier to kill or shoot a missile when you cannot see directly the people that you're about to right, kill. But as mo the moment you see those faces right in front of you, you see them as a human being, to kill someone like that becomes so much harder. So this means this uh, gossip is so easy today. Why? Because the person that we're gossiping about is not in front of us. The moment they sitting next to you or you see them close next, like real life, 
then there's a new reality that comes into there. It becomes so much harder to actually gossip, right? So this is where we need to set boundaries and confront and say, look, um, I actually don't appreciate what's being done because it, it is affecting me and um, others are not saying this. So, you know, and, and everyone has the right to be who they are. And I feel influenced by this. So this means you need to, you know, handle the situation in your own way. Okay. So that was the revision. Now let's continue Duryodhana's plots. What kind of plots has he set? I'm going to open up the questions soon. Okay. So the first plot was, okay, so what's the context of this? So, the, you know, Duryodhana was jealous and he wanted to eliminate the Pandavas. So his first action plan to eliminate was he uh, invited the Pandavas to a palace, a lovely wax house palace. Now, before I get there, just take it like this in real life. Imagine someone invites you and they're being nice and they're being like, you know, good, uh, pleasing manners. And they say, you know, I think you're such a good person and so, uh, such, so hardworking. I'm really impressed by everything you've done. And I, I thought that you should have a break. So I bought you a little travel package here. And you know, you're innocent. So you go, oh, thank you so much. Wow, you're so thoughtful. And you go and you arrive to your villa. Suppose it's a villa. And then you arrive there and you just want to rest. And some spies, you know, you got some spies there somehow. Maybe it's the COVID do the spies. They tell you, hey, you just, this, this guy who just told you about uh, this place, he's about to set this on fire. So you now know exactly that it's that person who gave you that ticket. And what do you do? You go, okay, uh, what should I do? What should I do? Uh, I'm just going to leave the villa, but I'm not going to tell them or her. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. I'm not going to confront them. So this was an attempted murder, <laughs> right? And you decide to keep your mouth shut. Now, does this sound normal to you? I mean, you be the judge of that. So this is what happened with the Pandavas. In other words, they found out that the wax house was about to be uh, burned down through his uh, Vidur spies. And what did they do? They just left through a tunnel and then didn't say anything. So the question is, this is where I open up the conversation. Not that there is a yes or no. I'm not interested in right or wrong here. There's no right or wrong. It's just a discussion. Do you think it is or was appropriate for the pandavas to keep their mouth shut or not to say anything? What do you think? Andre, can I go? Yes, please. Uh, so in my mind, this part of the story to me was, uh, this was a shift in the view, way of thinking for the Pandavas. I think my interpretation was that they realized that the way things have been going cannot continue. And there will eventually have to be some kind of either conflict or some serious way of changing how you're going to deal with Duryodhana. Uh, so normally you would think, okay, they would go to the to say, okay, he tried to kill us and whatnot, whatnot, which is the way they've kind of been handling things in the past. But I think there was a recognition within Yudhishthir that, okay, that's, that can't continue anymore. Why he decided to stay quiet, I don't know. I don't know whether that was in his mind. He's like, okay, we're going to end up in war now. I don't know if he had decided mm -hmm. that at that point. But to me, this was a shift. Yeah, this was a dramatic shift whereby they saw now the, the actual Duryodhana's intentions and it, was, it changed the relationship between them. Yeah. But, uh, okay, so, okay. And knowing that the relationship was now changed clearly, what do you think is the... Um, the intention for the Pandavas for keeping quiet? And was it wise to keep quiet? If you had it your way, what would it be? I think it was, uh, it was the right decision by the Pandavas to stay quiet for that, during that time. Okay. Because whenever we 
choose to fight we should know what is the right timing whether we should get into that fight of fight this time or maybe later during that situation when yudhish uh, when duryodhana made that plot of killing them you know the it was not just that wax house he had the uh, he had the plan that even if they survive in that wax house he will he will kill them you know anyhow and just uh, uh, tell to the uh, world that they they got killed in that fire okay so so there was a okay, okay so your argument is that there is a time to confront them absolutely and the danger was not over you know yeah duryodhan was sure that he has to kill them anyhow either in the wax house or even if they survive out of the wax house he would kill them you know outside and during that situation a lot of people were with duryodhan for example karna yeah shakuni and because he was the king and you know son of the king a lot of lot of uh, other people were also with him he okay. had the power during that time okay okay so therefore it was right you know on the part of the pandav to stay quiet at that time because they did not have any army they did not have any backing from any other yeah. kingdom during that time yeah okay good so point so survival was the best strategy during that time Okay, good good point actually. Now I see what you mean. So um so there is an aspect of timing. They didn't have the right resources to take on the situation successfully. So they thought they should put it maybe aside for a while until they have the right resources. Okay. Um Right. Um Martik, please. Yeah. I agree with Nina ji that they just wanted to postpone the war, I guess. Because they knew that this will end up in a war. and they didn't want to fight <coughs> so so uh, uh, okay all right anyone else andre yes uh, uh well the pandavas should have approached duryodhana and asked him what why his intention was you know what why the intention of burning the palace down Yeah. He should have approached, not start a war, but approached him, and make some inquiries. I think that would have been a wise, uh, sort of like a more um, practical way of resolving the problem. Okay. So, I mean, it doesn't mean he has to approach him harshly or anything like that. He yeah. should have just yeah. asked him, "Why did you want to burn us alive?" Um, he he denied it. So mm-hmm. even if he denies it, uh, obviously Duryodhana is going to walk away feeling very bad and guilty about it. Yeah. yeah and that he can't get away with it because he has approached him so i think approaching a uh, event like that should, is is a must you yeah. can't just forget it and walk away from it okay because okay. it's quite severe severe crime <coughs> okay david uh, i'm not here no i um, are this david or that david no you, uh, you. yourself I mean, Yes, um, I think it, sometimes it's um, to let someone know that they've done something, but indirectly. Just say, I'm just thinking of an example of someone was gossiping about my hat mm. to a colleague, and they didn't like my hat. And then just later on, I'm talking to them, and then I'll say, "Oh, do you like how how do you like my hat?" You know, so I don't actually confront them directly, and. like they they knew that they did the wrong thing mm-hmm. once once they once Jira Dana found the them uh, alive okay he obviously knew that they knew yeah 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 okay yeah yeah okay and i understand it so it's a more of a softer more a subtle approach to handling the situation yeah yeah okay right, that's a creative way of thinking about it okay anyone else I will agree with Nina. I think uh, <clears throat> the Pandavas have to be very strategic at this point, as she said. I mean, they don't have the resources, and they do have to have some time to plan. Yeah, they have to attack him by by going by negotiating with him. I don't think so. Knowing Duryodhana after so many other experiences, that there will be any uh, feasible uh, outcome. a good outcome of the, from the negotiation 
Yeah. So I think the Pandavas must have decided maybe this is the possible way to approach. Okay. See, this is, uh, this is why conversation is so good because everyone has a lovely input and the reality is there's no right or wrong answer here. It's just really about engaging our minds. Uh, so I do appreciate this input. Um, anyone else before I give you my input? Uh, I would, okay. No, sorry. <laughs> Madhu, you go. go no, ahead. no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Rock, paper, I'll just say something quickly. Um, just that I agree with everything that has been said so far. And because I don't know the story, actually, I, it would be good to know whether they did confront them just to discuss, discuss the issue first before the war, because it feels like this would be a good time to just have that happen at least for now. Okay, yeah. So yeah, so it's reinforcing uh, in, a, in a different approach to what we said. Yeah, good, Kelsey. Um, I would just like to say that this is going in a different time era. It's not today's world. And at that time, their lives were in danger. Yeah. And they, and they needed to protect themselves. And that would, would have been foremost in their mind at that time. Uh, you can't try and negotiate with someone at a time when your life is at risk and they needed to make their escape. Yeah. So what Matthew is saying is there's also that time uh, aspect of applying this into what would be done today, uh, not necessarily back then. So we have to again, bring it down to earth and you know, it would, so the times themselves change. Good. So Matthew's thinking now time-wise, and she's bringing an important aspect of today versus then. So this is why the Mahabharata is not a story about back then, 5,000 years ago. It is an open discussion that is always valid in whatever yuga you talk about. Okay. Now, my input is this. That was it wise? So I think that the Pandavas, again, uh, kept on repeating the same mistake that they had done before. And that is they kept giving a message to the Kauravas from childhood that it is even um, when Duryodhana wanted to uh, murder Bhima, right? In the, I think it was in a little river, right? Uh, from, from very early childhood, they never really stood up for themselves. They never really said it. And they thought they kept on forgiving over and over again it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, we'll forgive him. We'll, you know, he, he's going to grow up, he's going to grow up, he's going to improve, he's going to change. So every single time this happened, it, it sort of reinforced that what is clearly not appropriate is appropriate, that this adharma is actually dharma, right? So it almost gave this message to the Kauravas that, that what they're doing is okay. It's just like if I said last, last week or so that, you know, suppose your child is constantly, you know, wants to smoke and wants to um, bring in, you know, boys or girls and wants to host parties and wants to turn on music, maximum volume, and, you know, just play out loud and annoy the neighbors. And you just, you know, sort of have this uh, passive attitude of, oh, let, just let them play, you know, they're in their, they're in their child and they deserve to play. So, okay, so immediately it seems justifiable to do that. But in the future, what it actually does in the future is it creates a much harder chance to say no in the future because I've trained them that it's okay to be free. So this means that, again, one needs to set a certain level of boundaries. Otherwise, we just keep on forgiving over and over again. Then we're the ones who have to deal with that, 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 that stubbornness later on in the future. In fact, if I think about it, I'm actually very glad my parents uh, did personally kept always telling me it never, you know, alcohol is the most dangerous thing and drugs, like, it's like deadly. So I didn't know what, you know, alcohol or smoking or drugs is. I just, that's all I remember. But they actually did a very good job because I always thought like, whoa, stay away from that. And, and uh, so that's, you know, that, that helped me. So in that same way, you know, we need to sort of like say no. Otherwise, then it becomes a problem in the future. So the Pandava's mistake was not confronting this Adharma um, because it didn't happen once. It was, it was not the first time it happened. It happened in a small way before. Now, isn't it true that human behavior goes like this? A little bit first time. Next time, a little bit more. Next time, it is a bank robbery. 
right? First pickpocket, then steal the handbag, then do a raid, then it increases every single time. So this is just human behavior. It, 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 it amps up, it makes it okay. If I was successful back then and got away with it back then, what's going to stop me from being successful today? So that's the logic that a person makes if they're allowed to keep going with these adharmic acts. So this is just my take on it. I'm not saying I'm correct or wrong, just a way of looking at it. Okay, now, the second plot was when that failed and uh, the Pandavas came back to Hastinapur, obviously uh, Duryodhana was unpleased um, and he continued to invent different plans with Shakuni. So he thought, okay, now I'm going to invite the Pandavas from, you know, from, uh, from their Indra Prasta and I'm going to use that and compliment them and say, hey, you know, I want to invite you to Hastinapur and I want to just congratulate you. Um, and he said that he wants to play dice or wants to play a game of well, dice with, uh, with Yudhishthira. Now, Yudhishthira was a king, right? And in, back in those times, it was a tradition that a king couldn't refuse once invited to a game of dice because that would if you refuse, it basically compromises your valor. Like, hey, I can play with you. Why not? So when the, uh, you know, Yudhishthira finally arrived, now before he arrived, it was already advised that Yudhishthira should not play, even by Bhishma himself, right? So again, this is, what is the saying? We keep on getting these markers from the society, from, from wise people, from those who have knowledge, from, have, from those who have clarity, but we keep ignoring them we, because we cannot accept their word. We want to stay in our own narrative. And that narrative overrides the words of those who clearly have this knowledge. And this causes our own uh, c continuity of mistakes. So this is what happened with Yishtira. He kept on getting, no, 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 don't. But he said, no, I'm going to play anyway. So when finally Yudhishthira sat down in the royal court where Bhima, Dronacharya, um, you know, Vidur, and um, um, who else was there? Um, the both Pandavas and the Kauravas were there, right? So the five of them sat on one side and there was um, Karna, there was Duryodhana, there was um, Dushasana. So Kuni. And there was Shakuni, right? And the one on the other side. Now, the moment Yudhishthira sat down, what did Duryodhana say? I like my uncle Shakuni to play on my behalf. Right? Because the original plan was Yudhishthira was going to play against Duryodhana. So this was a promise. This was clear. But now, suddenly, in that moment, the game changes. Now, Yudhishthira knew that Shakuni was a master at cheating or let's just say manipulating the dice in his favor. He knew that. But what did he do? Did he say, no, this is not right because we agreed to play together. He did not say this before. Or he said, again, he let Duryodhana get away with it. And he said, okay, I allow you. I allow, I allow Shakuni to play on your behalf. He allowed Shakuni to play on Duryodhana's behalf. In other words, why? Because he kept on giving license. He couldn't say no before to Duryodhana. So this trained Yudhishthira also to keep on saying yes, yes, yes. In other words, Yudhishthira in this case is a, you could say a case of a people pleaser. He wanted to please Duryodhana. Now, what is a people pleaser? What is someone who wants to please people? Weak. Yeah, weak, okay. Why? Uh, but what, what makes us want to please people? And the other is so like hmm? So the people like us. Yeah, so they like us, yeah. So, okay, and why would we want others to like us? And the other is to uh, win favors. To win favors, yeah. Others can like us. 
Makes us feel good. Hmm? Makes us feel good. Nikhail, yeah? Uh, sometimes it's the path of least resistance. Good, yeah. Path of least resistance. So immediate, in other words, immediate satisfaction. I don't want to be rejected. I want to be loved by you. So what do I do? Again, this happens in families especially. I don't want to be rejected by saying no. Parents also fall for this because they want that love from the kid. But what do they do? Just like you teach Tira, people, pleaser, child, it doesn't matter who it is. So this trains the side to get their ways and it also weakens us to say no next time. In other words, it reduces our capacity to negotiate. And what is life but being effective in negotiation? Now, I don't mean just business negotiation, but I mean negotiating with spouse, negotiating with conflict resolution, with the shopkeeper, with the plumber, with uh, whoever happens to be in your presence. It's, it's really just effective communication skills without putting this show of, oh, let me please you because it's about me here. So again, this insecurity crept in and this makes Yutishtira, uh, you know, want to keep on pleasing Duryodhana. So what's the moral here? The moral is, just one potential again. I'm not saying this is absolute. What Yudhishthira should have done or could have done was do what needs to be done. This is called Swadharma. Now, what do I mean by this? Do what needs to be done. In other words, in this situation, the promise was I play against you, not against Shakuni. So what do I mean by do what needs to be done? I need to say that this is not right. I made this promise and now you're changing your mind. I say no. This is called, what is Swadharma? Acting appropriately with clarity in the moment as challenges arise. Instead of bringing our insecurities and responding in the name of them. Like fear of rejection, fear of being disliked. In other words, this is not about being liked or disliked, but rather doing one's Swadharma appropriately as the challenges arise. Whether the consequences are of like or dislike, that is actually, that actually shouldn't be on the person's mind because that it comes from insecurity. And that insecurity then modifies the response that we give. This is called not doing swadharma. This is called playing out in the, in the name of likes and dislikes. It becomes about myself. So again, we can see how even someone as sophisticated as Yudhishthira can fall into these subtle psychological traps. Okay. Now, as Yudhishthira kept, okay, what happened first? He, he first lost, I think, his necklace, right? Small thing, isn't it? But then yeah, yeah. kept on gambling. Being, yeah. And then what, the, the elephants, the, the horses, the armies. So in other words, as I said before, at the beginning, it is always small. Next time, you give yourself permission for a little bit more. Next time, more. Next time, more. Until what happened then? He was able to say, I even give you my brother. I, I think he started with uh, B or Nakul or Sahadev, right? And then one brother after the other. So this is what we mean. We start small and then we justify that next time it is okay. But if you contrast that moment when you started and now five years later, when we started, we would have never said yes to that, what we would have said yes five years later. In fact, there was a psychological experiment, I remember uh, in real estate markets, what happened was uh, the person, uh, the, the, uh, the experiment was to put a sign in front of someone's house and uh, to say no parking here. Nobody agreed. I don't want a house in front of, I don't want a sign in front of my house that says no parking. So what, what happened then? They did a second experiment. They asked for a small favor. They knocked on the door and they said, uh, can we just um, you know, paint the, the pavement? We want to repaint the pavement. Sure, yes. Can we just um, change a few, uh, few things around? I think we'll cut the bark of a tree. No problems. Can we put a sign in front of your house that says no parking? Yeah, no, no problem. 
So in other words, we say yes, small, and then we track, trap ourselves and we say yes to something big that you otherwise would have never said yes to in the first place. Again, psychology is at play. Okay, <clears throat> so you teach that I kept on gambling and uh, he couldn't stop. So what is, this, what is the meaning of this? You cannot stop. Addicted. Think about this. Addiction. Addicted. I think he was addicted to gambling. Addicted, yeah. Okay, let's convert this into real life. What is like, I can't stop in real life? Give me an example. I think in gambling, people usually, when they lose the small, <clears throat> And they try to, they start betting to win back what they have, they have lost. And eventually they, it will become a big loss. And that's what, pro probably that's what uh, this try did. Good, okay. You, so what you just touched on is something important is um, I've lost, now I want to get back what I've lost. Yes. So what is that? Greed. Now greed comes in. Mm. So immediately after losing, greed follows. This is what we mean by cause, effect. One thing leads to the other. There's no such thing as that's it, it stops there. It always leads onto something else. Um, and what else do you think uh, that, uh, that, that uh, Yudhishthira could have otherwise done? Okay, was it right to uh, give away his brothers? The answer is, Okay, it's not a direct answer because in real life, it would have been much harder to, you know, to, to say stop. So the question is, or the observation is, once we begin, if we don't stop right now, the next time becomes much harder. That's just the reality. So this means there is an aspect, a crucial aspect of saying no right from the start. Because we all know in real life that it is so hard to say no much later on, once we became, say, kept saying yes, 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 yes. Okay. But I think yeah, there was a, a lot of selfishness on Yudhistra. I mean, giving away his brother and betting his wife as well. Kingdom, everything is just losing everything, but he was only focused on trying to win, yeah. but did not think about the others. Good simply, point, good point. Excellent. Isn't that how, uh, what the, another psychology at play is? Our, so what happens? We have the big picture, right? The big picture is I know what needs to be done. This is called Swadharma. And through this entanglement of what matters to me, what matters and what doesn't matter, we tend to focus on what like a narrow, like a narrow vision and only that. So the moment we do that, we lose focus with everything else. So in this case, what Sundaram is saying is, all that becomes important is this one single aspect whereby I am what? Ignoring everything else around me. So this is where this aspect of keeping the big vision is crucial because the moment we lose the big picture of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, how today's actions are making difference tomorrow, that is as good as taking this whole big you know, vision and then just going through one single mirror. And that's all I see. This is so called is. Sub subjectivity. Is this similar to what his father did, Pandu did, uh, being negligent and not mindful? Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, I'm not gonna bring. I'm gonna. I'm gonna bring bring Pandu right now uh, for destiny uh, because it's an important discussion, and how negligence and destiny come together. Okay. <clears throat> so eventually, Draupadi was also staked. Imagine that uh, your your wife is you know cooking, and suddenly. People come after her and say, your, your husband was in the other room and he staked you and you're like, I was just cooking him a dinner. Why do I deserve this? Now, the important point is, did Draupadi, remember what last, I said last week, did Draupadi just say, oh, Yudhishthira is my master. He leads, the man leads. I'm just going to surrender and I'm just going to do whatever he told me. Is that what she did? No. No. Or what did she do? She refused. She was able to think for Yudhishthira. She used her own buddhi to assess the situation and think for herself. This is why we say there's no such thing as man or woman, only man or only woman lead. It's both. Both need to be involved. Because why? Both are manusha. What is manusha? 
thinking being. This means if one is unable to think today, then the other can help and think on their behalf because the other just happens to be clear today, the other is not so clear today. Next, tomorrow it's going to change. So, it's, so that's where this support comes in. So Draupadi is actually a good example of what it means to be a really uh, strong woman that other women can be inspired to be, to, to be like. For example, you know, she didn't just, you know, subordinate and say, oh, you know, I'm just a, a, a wife and I want to please my husband. No, she even said that Yudhishthira first lose himself and then stake me or that Yudhishthira stake me and then lose himself. Now, when she said lose himself, we know the, the you know, we know the gambling lost himself. That's easy. But what does she really mean when she said lose himself? Lose himself. Go back lost to the his spine. Yeah. Maybe it's lost his spine. <laughs> lost his discrimination, perhaps. Lost his, excellent. Lost his discrimination. In other words, when I can no longer discriminate, what needs to be done right now when I lose this image of this, this big vision, then it is as good as saying I have lost myself because now it becomes all about one single point winning. Therefore, we can see how Draupadi is using her discernment, her clarity to, to try to stand up for herself before giving herself away. Right? So remember what we said about setting boundaries? So she, she tried her best. She, she tried to say no and she tried to explain why this is not right. She didn't just say, okay, sorry, let me go. So this is a character of a strong woman. Now, when she could no longer sustain uh, the power of Dushasana's physical strength, this is when she was you know, dragged over and into the court. Now, how do you think Draupadi felt as she was dragged, pulled by her hair in front of elders, respectable elders in court? If you were Draupadi, how would you feel? Disrespected. Hmm? Disrespected. Humiliated. Humiliated, yeah. Humiliated. Demor demoralized. Demoralized. What, what else comes to your mind? Shattered. Hmm? Feel shattered. Shattered, yeah. And maybe there's also a recognition that she's uh, in a household where a woman can be disrespected. So she's wondering what kind of a household is this? Like where the elders, where the king, where the teachers can all sit there and watch this happen and not say anything. Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah Matu? Yeah, I think she was also uh, thinking, uh, how do I resolve, how do I get out of this? How do I solve this problem that has come up as well? Sure, I mean, she sure. would be shattered, but there would be lots of thoughts going through her head. Yeah. I'm being humiliated. Why has my husband done this to me, my husband? And how do I deal with all this now? Good. Yeah, good, Matthew. Good thinking. Okay, what else comes to mind? Um, how, what, what would have gone through Draupadi's reality as she's suddenly finding herself in this place, dragged by the hair, um, and, and seeing her <laughs> husbands lost the game? I think uh, none of them came to defend her. Um, yeah. Everybody stepped back, I guess, as well as others who know her, uh, like Drona, and I don't know whether Bishma was there too. But I mean, all these people who know her, nobody defended or uh, stopped uh, Duryodhana from doing such a terrible thing to deal with her. Yeah, true, true. Okay. And therefore, she said, I mean, eventually she had no other hope other than to surrender to Krishna. Yeah, okay, we'll get to Krishna soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So, and what about shame? Mm -hmm. You think she felt a sense of shame? Very shameful. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay, and what is, uh, what is shame? Loss of respect. Okay, okay. Now, suppose uh, we have shame, because all of us actually have some level of shame towards ourselves uh, from childhood, from something that happened and we felt. Um, well, like we didn't want to exist. That's what shame basically is. I, I don't want to be known by anyone right now. I don't want to be here. 
Like I feel like totally overpowered, overwhelmed, um, completely demoralized, humiliated. I just don't want to exist right now. So how do we come out of this shame later on? Because shame stays with us, you know, for mm-hmm. sometimes for a whole life, it follows us in, in small ways. And it comes out as a behavior of not willing to, let's say, participate or thinking that my opinion is not valuable or that I'll be judged if I say something or I'm not worthy of speaking <clears throat> to you or, you know, it just comes in so many ways. But how do we come out of this shame? You'll have to dig deep. Say again. You don't have any support coming in from internal sources. So you have to dig deep within yourself to find out uh, what you could do, um, like I just stated earlier. And also try to, in a sense, uh, like she did, pray. Pray to Lord Krishna. Look for uh, help from, if you want, uh, spiritual sources. Right. You've got to dig deep. You've got to dig deep within yourself because you know that in deep shame, you're all by yourself. You have nothing to stand on, as you say, because you've lost everything which was treated as respect during your life. Right. You have to dig deep. Okay. Okay. Uh, one of the points that Mohan mentioned was, uh, at least that I got out of it, is a support. Support is necessary to come out of this shame. So, for example, uh, if we don't have someone to share our dilemma, our you know shame that we can feel comfortable with, then how is it going to come out? Because the fact that it's there implies that sharing the shame to ourselves hasn't worked. So we need a different strategy. And this is where the strategy, this is where that, the, the principle of having someone that you trust, that you can speak to about, like actually confessing, like this happened to me. What do you think of it? Just, just not feeling that sense of uh, threat, but feeling okay to share that shame. That alone can alleviate so much of this shame that we carry uh, in our lives. So this means that we need someone to actually share it because holding things in is clearly not working for you. It, it can work because some of us have this capacity to resolve it ourselves. But in most cases, uh, it, it is most uh, useful to actually share it with someone that you trust who's not going to now go and say, oh, you look what happened and so on. Someone you feel comfortable with. Okay. Another way is to, you can actually even make a joke out of it um, and blow it up like a cartoon. And this is actually quite effective because um, it's actually used in NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, is you, you take a, an event in your life that sort of you know, haunts you and it keeps on coming back and it embarrasses us. And we take that event and we turn it into a cartoon. And then we you know, put some Bugs Bunny there, put some funny characters, funny faces, and you just kind of play it back and forth, back and forth and make like funny sounds, turn it into something that is a uh, like more, lot more humorous. So these are just some of the ways that we can deal with our own internal processes of these uh, emotions. Uh, one, to share it, and two, to make it lighter because shame is a load, it's a heavy load. So we can make that load lighter by turning into something that's humorous, going, ah, funny. So you make that funny uh, story, that funny narrative in your mind, you probably know how to. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to say something. Yes, please, George. Uh, hi, my name is George, and um, this just reminded me of Byron Katie, um, who became famous by her work. And one of the steps in the in the work by Byron Katie is to turn it around the sentence. Like, if you have, if I have the sentence, I feel vulnerable because uh, I don't want to speak because I don't want to appear uh, stupid. Then she says, turn it around and make the sentence the op- the opposite. For example, I'm happy to make myself uh, appear stupid by saying something. Okay. And that works Brilliant. sometimes as well. Brilliant. Yeah, you can, you can make a sentence and then maybe change the words around and replace them with different words and, and see how that sounds. That's a good idea. Yeah, it's a pretty good work because you, you, you focus on what, what you're f- afraid of. And then you turn it around by saying, I'm happy to appear as stupid or whatever it is. 
Wow. George, yeah, I reckon that's a, a really great point because I think when you're in the, the position that she is, you, you're incredibly vulnerable. You feel um, very lonely, um, fearful, you know, those, those fears of being judged and embarrassed and to almost get to a point where you own that and have the courage to turn it around and say, you know what, this has happened to, to me. I am where I am, but it's not going to impact me. Bring it on sort of thing um and you know whether you turn the the humor into it and just say you know it's water off a, a duck's back um but sort of own and, and understand and just be comfortable um with it uh, yeah good good day yeah so we're bringing some light into it because uh, you know we carry this and we take it so seriously the whole life becomes about oh i'm so you know i've gone through this and gone through that and i'm unfortunate so we'll just bring some lightness into it, but make it a little bit, you know, humorous. And it's not a, it's, it's like, ah, you know, so what? And do a little cartoonish, become a child like that. All right. So Andre, what I was thinking about shame is, you know, there are two, two main causes that brings us shame. The one is, you know, when someone else disrespects us and, you know, make us feel uh, small. Mm -hmm. then we feel we feel the shame or we feel ashamed of ourselves mm -hmm. i think in that situation we should set boundaries with the person you know who is uh, attempting this mm -hmm. or if this is really of that nature that could be punished it should be punished too the second the second category of shame is where you know we do something wrong we commit a sin yeah. right yeah. And then we feel ashamed of ourselves. What, what did I do? Uh, this is something I should not be doing. Mm. I think in that case, and that brings us, you know, that brings a feeling of guilt, feeling of inferiority in us. Yeah. In that case, we should repent and we should correct ourselves. I think that should, that should solve the problem. True, true. So we should uh, make a self-correction and not just feel a victim of our own uh, negligence. Right. Right. Good. Good, Mina. Good point. Okay. Okay. I want to bring now a, a much bigger topic, and that is uh, in this scene also, there is a tendency to say that Draupadi's disrobing was destiny. This was meant to happen to her, and she had no choice. In other words, there's a statement that destiny is fixed so this statement destiny is fixed is deeply fixed in the society so let's talk about this okay for example let's go back to pandu many variables contributed to pandu killing the sage Many variables. What I mean by many variables? That means many uh, intervening circumstances. For example, perhaps Pandu was walking and he stubbed his toe on a metal nail that fell out of a merchant's bag 200 years ago. And therefore, this pain contributed to Pandu walking slower and arriving at the time when the sage and his wife just happened to be in the stream collecting water for 30 seconds. 200 years ago, a nail was dropped. Pandu happened to stub his toe over that. That changed or modified his walking speed. Because it did so, he arrived slower, he arrived earlier, at the time when the sage and his wife happened to be collecting water for 30 seconds. If he walked just 0.5 kilometers faster, he would have not caught them. He would have not gotten or heard the sage or the, or the wife. That could have happened. Maybe rain fell recently. And because it fell, it made the ground softer. Therefore, it was harder to walk on. And because it was harder, it caused Pandu to think 
what other path can I take because this ground is too soft? Therefore, again, Pandu's trajectory on the basis of the rain causing the ground to be soft was changed and he just happened to encounter the sage on that new path that he took. That could have been the case. Perhaps the sight of a tiger that Pandu has encountered, or at least thought he saw, caused a little bit of fear in him. And this fear contributed to lesser focus in Pandu's mind, which caused him to not be so sharp as he otherwise could have been, therefore mistaking the sage and his wife for an animal. That also could have happened. So what am I saying here? I'm giving these examples. It doesn't matter what examples you use. You can keep on going with your own. But I'm just saying how thousands and thousands of variables seemingly completely unconnected contributed to this very circumstance where Pandu has met his, his so-called destiny to be killing the sage and the wife. So the distorted version of destiny goes something like this. This is our common version of destiny. The Pandu and the sage situation was prescripted. It was already written. It was supposed to happen. So Pandu was meant to shoot the arrow. And that very sage and that very wife were supposed to die specifically on that day by his arrow. So this is a black or white thinking. It didn't require any thinking. It just, it just sort of said, yep, Pandu and the sage and wife met. They were meant to meet on that day, and that's just the way it happened. That's called destiny. So in other words, it takes all of this minutia out, takes away this thinking being out of the situation, path of least resistance. It's the easiest way to explain what has happened. All you do is just brush it off as it's meant to happen, but we don't bring in thousands of variables like these intervening causes that have, what does intervening causes mean? That means intermediary, those things that came in between that we don't even give attention to. We ignore out of our own negligence. And because of our of own negligence, we ignore it. The easiest way to justify what has happened right now is just to say, this was meant to be. I'm meant to meet my teacher. Another common one. You know how many variables came along to actually meet the person that you, that you so-called call your teacher? For example, you know, for example, you're thinking, right? You're thinking, uh, how, what's the reality of this need? I want to figure out who am I? And that causes, influences our thoughts to go to Google and search an appropriate venue or, or event. We go to that event and we just happen to be coming with people who are also thinking on the same line. That person now, someone in that event says, here, I recommend this person. He may help you. You go, okay, sure. Let me get his number. I call him up. I'm going to come to his event. You come over to his event and go, yeah, this is closer to what I was thinking, but it's not quite what I want. In that venue, someone else says, well, here's someone, here's a different kind of teacher that actually can help you. You pick up that number. Again, you go to the website and you just happen to go, uh, you book a plane ticket and the plane ticket cancels your, your ticket because you know, they're, they're out of service. So this means now you can't attend that event. Because you can't attend that event, you have to wait three months. But during those three months, you actually encounter another person in your local area who is the very person who you were looking for all your life, right? So what I'm doing is I'm bringing so many circumstances that contributed to us being where we are today. Okay, so when we say meant to, right, this is meant to happen. We're meant to be together. I was meant to meet you. You were meant to meet me. This happens very often in partnerships. To make themselves feel better, they say we were meant to meet together. Very common. Uh, is that very meant to contradicts Ishwara's nature, which is infinite possibilities in potential. Infinite possibilities in potential is Ishwara's nature. 
That means there's no such thing as this is the only possibility. But infinite possibilities are in, that means they're able to happen. How? By the person's actions collapsing those possibilities through their own choices. So this means there's infinite possibilities right now. What possibility I receive depends on which one I collapse. But how do I collapse? By the choices, by the action that I put out into the field. For example, uh, suppose that there is a possibility right now of falling. Every one of us can fall down, right? So how do you fall down? All you do is just stand on the edge of a building and you just fall. In other words, gravity is always operating. It's always there. And I can collapse the potential of falling just by doing an action that leads me to falling. But right now, is any of us falling? No one's falling. Why? Because we're not collapsing that potential. So these infinite possibilities that are in unmanifest, we convert them into manifest. How? Through the very actions that we do. And depending on which actions we do, it either leads to success, that means progression or regression. Okay, so in other words, we collapse through our own choices. But not only we, also the environment contributes to collapsing those choices for us. For example, I used that example of um, uh, the four cops last week. And see, even if you're careful, all you want, right? You're doing your duty. You're driving the car very carefully. It doesn't matter because someone can still crash into you. So what does this mean? Not only do we collapse possibilities, but the environment also contributes to collapsing possibilities, thus causing us to be where we are today. So it's not only us, it's also the environment. And these two characteristics, these two components are always in full effect, creating every single day to be exactly what it is today. I'll give you some more examples. Uh, suppose that you know the law of biology. Suppose you say, okay, I want to know the law of biology. Now, what is the law of biology? By nourishing the body, what are you going to do? You're going to keep healthy. If you violate that law of biology, that means you collapse the possibility of not being in line with the law of biology of the body, what happens to the body? The immune system suffers. So this means the possibility of the immune system suffering is possible right now. But are we collapsing it? No. Why not? Because we are eating, we are keeping healthy, we're keeping fit. If we stop doing those actions, then we receive in accordance with those actions. And that is a weaker immune system. Okay. So what I'm showing is how not only, again, are we involved, but also the environment is contributing to our, uh, to our very uh, results to where we are today. So now let's refine this destiny just a little bit. I'm not going to say let's correct it because refine word opens up possibilities for you to think further. Uh, we can say that I am here or you are here. It doesn't matter I or you. We are here because of infinite causes and effects. And those causes and effects, some of them were contributed by me. Some of them were contributed by the environment. That's just the reality. It's not only you that are, that are causing your life to be where it is. It's also the world that's causing life to be where it is. For example, right now, suppose that there's an explosion uh, in the factory and it contaminates the air. It means what? I have to breathe that air. But have I collapsed that potential? Was I involved? No. So this means where we are today is not all. However, now, see now, so there's pollution in the air, right? But I can still make a modification. I can now put a gas mask on. So not only is the possibility collapsed by the environment, 
but it still gives me a choice now to continue collapsing these possibilities by what I do afterwards. That means I can now go out and expose myself and then get sick, or I can close the windows and keep safe. So these possibilities are being collapsed constantly, which we, is what we call uh, these, uh, this destiny. So this destiny is not only consisting of immediate causes, which I will explain uh, when it gets to Draupadi, but also uh, intermediary causes. What is intermediary causes? Those causes that come in between, which seems like we didn't take any part in. And, and it's true, we didn't take any part in the factory exploding. You were just doing your work uh, like a happy person, but that still happened. Okay. Now, uh, it's also the reason why Krishna told, there was a, there was a scene in Mahabharata where um, it was clear that Ashwatthama couldn't be killed, the, uh, the, the Dronacharya couldn't be killed. So the strategy was that uh, Krishna suggested to Arjuna that Ashwatthama uh, had to be announced that he was dead because that was the only way to, you know, to cause Dronacharya to put down his bow. So uh, after some disagreement, Krishna said, because Arjuna didn't want to lie, he thought, I need to be honest here. I can't lie that Ashwatthama is dead when he's not dead. So what did Krishna say? Hey, who are you to win or lose this war? Your duty, you, you are here because you happened to be here, right? In brackets, because of all of the causes that happen in between. Now that you're here, your duty is to fight the war. In other words, Krishna is not saying you're here because you're meant to be. It's your destiny or it's your fate. But because of the intermediary causes and immediate causes that took place, you, Arjuna, happen to be in this situation right now. Just like I could be now in this house with the toxic air outside. So what did now Krishna say? Who are you to now judge what has happened? Your duty is now to act accordingly. This is called Swadharma. And that is what Krishna was trying to say to Arjuna. Stop trying to analyze hundreds and thousands of causes and effects because it is way too complex for a human mind to understand. All that we can understand is the, the, when we align ourselves with these laws like gravity, like biology, like electricity, like physics, then we can take advantage of that alignment and therefore live a successful life. For example, if I violate the law of gravity, then I get hurt. So this means it pays us to understand these laws and then after understanding to live in line with them. That's what creates a successful life. Now, what creates suffering? What creates suffering is not knowing about these laws. Suppose now, I don't care about gravity. You know, it's all this mumbo jumbo. Uh, COVID is a uh, conspiracy. It doesn't exist. So I just keep on exposing myself and then eventually I catch the disease and I die. In other words, I'm out of alignment with these laws, with, with science, with data, and because I violated, I then collapse the potential or the possibility of suffering. So what creates suffering? Out of alignment with these laws. Right. So our actions therefore follow this out of alignment. Okay, now, another statement is death is predetermined. Okay, I'll call this a distorted statement. And I'll take a recent example here in Blackburn. A four-year-old child uh, has uh, been in a situation with his father and sister, whereby high wind, high speed wind, collapsed the tree and it fell onto the boy. It killed the four-year-old boy. You heard of this? Blackburn. Yeah, happened, right? Yeah, I even heard the ambulance very near me. Now, again, so we're not judging the boy or anything. We're just analyzing the situation to analyze the statement that death is predetermined. Let's see if it's really predetermined. So again, infinite variables contributed to this event. We'll start like that. For example, during World War II, what happened during World War II? Industrial revolution. In other words, 
machine, the factory started to be developed and therefore emit CO2 into the atmosphere. This CO2, what, uh, 60 years later, modified the climate in such a way as to, in, to, to increase the speed of the wind by an extra two kilometers, it's fair to say. So the wind took out the tree because it blew at what? Let's say 71 kilometers an hour. If it was 69 kilometers an hour, then the wind would have not been strong enough to dislodge the tree out of the ground. So something that happened during World War II, because of that industrial revolution, contributed to CO2. CO2 changed the world weather patterns, which sped up the wind extra two kilometers, which was just enough to dislodge the tree from the ground. Seemingly unrelated and yet completely related. But we don't attribute the past causes, the, these past intermediary causes to the present. Therefore, we just justify, oh, it's meant to happen. Another example is, so what, what happened to the tree? It dislodged from the ground, right? Now, how, now, from where did the wind blow? Suppose it blew from the south, right, from the, from the harbor. How many intermediary buildings were there until it finally arrived at the tree? How many buildings? Thousands of buildings, thousands of trees modified the course of the direction of that wind. Thousands of them. So the wind blows straight, and as it blows through all of these buildings, it modifies slightly. Now, it hits the tree just at the right angle that was able to dislodge it. Now, suppose that the tree, because you know a tree grows roots, obvious, but some roots on the left side are weaker than the, the roots on the right side. That's just the case it is. So it happened to blow on the side where the roots were weaker. If it blew from maybe just five degrees to the left, it would have blown a, a tree to the side where the, the root on the opposite side would have kept it in ground. Therefore, it couldn't be dislodged. So the buildings themselves contributed to the wind speed hitting the tree at the right weak point as to dislodge it because the weak roots on one of its side couldn't hold back the, the tree down. If you want to go one step further, when a tree grows, what happens? It spreads roots out. Suppose there's a rock in the roots direction. What does the root do? It has to bypass the rock. So because there's a rock in the ground, the root had to bypass. And because it bypassed, it just happened to be in a direction that it couldn't hold the tree. When the wind finally struck, what, 40 years later after the tree has matured. Again, what I'm showing is how intricate these details are and how much deeper you can keep going and on the basis of this, we say, despite all of this, we say what? It is all meant to be. No way. So in other words, all of these intervening and, inter and immediate causes have contributed to this event taking place. For all you know, you can even say that if the father, because the father in later on said regretted, I should have not went out. If he had a stomach ache yesterday, then he would have not made that choice to go out today that also would have contributed. So again, so many variables are going on and we do not understand them. All we have to understand is this world is nothing but cause effect. One thing leads to the other. Whether we understand this cause effect, it doesn't matter because it's way beyond our minds to understand. But the point is, it is in full operation. This cause effect reality. Now, I want to bring this into the case of Draupadi, and this will happen next week. So what I'm going to do is next week, I will show us how Draupadi, uh, what is this destiny in relation to Draupadi? Uh, was it her destiny to be disrobed and why is she in that, in that position? And then I want to uh, ask the question, was it justified that nobody in court uh, stop Draupadi's disrobing. What is the meaning that only Krishna was able to save Draupadi? And how, and then I want to get into the Indra Prasta. How did the, uh, the Pandavas cope during their exile in the forest? And about this coping method. How do we in life cope? And I'm going to tie it into the, uh, the coping method of the Pandavas. Okay, so lots of discussion and lots of questions. 
Okay, open up conversation a little bit. If any comments. Andre, I just wanted to make one quick comment on what you were talking about, the cause and effect and the variables. There's actually a name for this phenomenon. It's called the butterfly effect, in case yeah, anybody's right. interested on in reading. Yeah, yeah, that's an English term. Good, you reminded me, butterfly effect. You heard? You heard, guys? Butterfly. And there's just... butterfly flying. <laughs> But is there, is there something to do with the uh, cause and effect, the law of karma? Yeah, um, karma just means cause effect. Yeah, so that's uh, possibly like, you know, if, if somebody is, I mean, died because of a tree fell on the person, whether it is predestined, we do not know, but it, could it be the cause that has got, brought this effect? Could it be the karma, the past karmas? Yeah, okay. So this is why I want to bring Draupadi, uh, past life, also into this cause effect. And I also want to bring um, in DNA because your DNA, your genetics also influence what happens to the body. Because if the 23 chromosomes, for example, are coming from the mother who happened to have a, a, a medical condition, then that DNA is also going to contribute to what you call destiny of your own body. So, so we have to also include the genetics. Yeah, um, but also past life. Andre, the like in relation to that tree story that you just said just then. Yeah. Um, now, I mean, going look, I, I I never heard about that story, and I feel you know like um, compassion towards them. But when when a accident, uh, sorry, an accident like that happens, they councils tend to get involved, and they say, well, listen we better do a, I forget the words, you know, like, um, Root cause the, analysis. Yeah. Uh, all the trees in that particular area or whatever, let's do an, an analysis of them, you know, so it doesn't mm -hmm. happen again. So that this, uh, yeah, like, um, won't happen again. So therefore, like, are they preventing, well, you know, uh, I forget the guy's name. Makatu, um, uh, karma, karma towards, yeah. karma towards. Like, are they stopping karma, or that's that's also too part of the, um, you know, the not the yeah. story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so all they're doing is they're just responding to an an, an effect. So they're creating yeah. new causes in response to what has happened. Yes. Now, there's no guarantee that those new effects are going to solve the problem because that's going to potentially introduce now bats, which you have to now deal with, right, mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. so, um, so again, what, I, what we're showing is that one thing always leads to the other, and our life is a result of the collective environment and also our own choices in response to the environment's uh, happenings. So, and, and, and not only that, but the more, more important part is it doesn't stop there because now you say, okay, well, so what do I do with this? The point is not to just say, oh, I'm here, I'm a victim to what's happening to my circumstances. Yeah. Well, that's what I was aiming at. Right. But there's an action that requires to be done to, to keep us moving forward. For example, uh, Arjuna was in that situation of having to now you know, kill his uh, dear ones on the other side. But it, it, what did Krishna say? You can't just now, you know, feel remorseful and go to Himalayas and, you know, it's not going to solve the problem. Mm. You, you're confronted with what is happening right now. Deal with it. Yeah. The problem is we take it personally. Yep. And then we put a narrative around it. And then we say, well, you know, why is this happening to me? I'm so unlucky. Right. And so what I want to bring up next week is, yes, there is a level of control that we have, but also in response to the environment, what that brings us we also don't have that much control as we would like to have. So it's not just one or the other, it's both. Yes, Dave. Yeah, yeah. Andre, just, uh, I've, I've always had a bit of an issue with this concept of, um, I guess, predetermined destiny. And it sort of feels like the, the more I'm learning through, uh, I guess, your teachings and, and others, that it feels like it's, that's sort of like a concept created by the ego and that the, you know, the ego almost has this inherent <laughs> sense of, it's Jeeva's own self-importance um, and that there's a lot of cause and effect that, that does happen, but sort of almost having to get the ego to acknowledge and accept that all things, that things happen that are good and bad through mm. an infin infinite number of potential cause and effects that happen. Mm. Um, and these things can happen to 
me as part of that process, which may be a result of past actions, but you know, this, this team where like in one life and it, it's like, well, that happened. That's really bad luck. But you know, your busners and your tendencies sort of carry forward and sort of continue on uh, in, in this path that we do. It almost has this, um, yeah, this predetermined destiny of a Jeeva's life. I sort of, sort of grapple with that. It sort of feels yeah. like you're more important than, you know, Ishwara and the rest of what yeah, is. And you're like a victim uh, because see, even if we say, you know, we're meant to be together, then, then that's actually subtle pride. That's saying, you know, I am luckier than everyone else. You know, this is meant to be, to, this is meant to be. So obviously I'm so lucky that I'm here and, and others are not where I'm at. So again, it's bringing that subtle importance of the path of least resistance, trying to feel good about oneself by uh, calling their, by defining their situation as it's predetermined, right? I am loved. I am loved by the grand creator. Therefore, it is meant to be, right? So yes, there is a reality in that, uh, that jiva giving reality to, to one's position. Yeah. Yeah, at the same time, I would like to add um, that there is some fine line because um, in science, uh, when you read Albert Einstein, um, yeah. he made it somehow clear that the past and the future is not as um, existent as we think. Like, it's not quite easy to get to understand it, but as far as I understand it, um, there is some predetermination, but I cannot really. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. We're not the, the denying that there is a predetermined uh, cause effect relationship. As I said, the environment will, you know, for example, if they, now is there a, a meteor coming towards the earth? That just happened because of so many things that happened before then, you know, a planet exploded and two meteors collided and one of them happened to be in the trajectory of, of the earth. So from that sense, yeah, okay, that's, predetermined, but we have to change this word of predetermined. You have to understand what do you mean when you say predetermined? What I'm trying to explain is there is an intermediary and there is an immediate cause. And this needs to be addressed before we say the word destiny or fate. Otherwise we're defining into a black or white mode. And that is not what this is about because Manusha thinks. Um, Andre, can you just clarify this for me? I just recently read a book, um, Predictions, yeah. uh, by Sylvia Brown, and yeah. it was written and published in 2008. Yeah. And we are in 2020. In the book, is written, 2008 is written, yeah. that 2020, there will be a virus called coronavirus. Now, how is that known fact? It's that many years ago. Yeah, it's, it's going to happen. And it also said when it's happening. Yeah. Last yeah. October. Sure, sure. So, and for example, continue. Yeah, yeah. So, for example. So in what, what is that? Um, you know, a sensitive mind, a mind that's clear, can tap into, okay, without going to the big details, two partners. I remember seeing you once on the plane when Dave woke up and you, no, oh, you were Dave, sleeping, Dave. you were sleeping and Dave woke up and you just woke up and I was blown away. How did you even know that? Remember that? Okay. Uh, okay so, 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 so Rani was sleeping. Um, I was sitting next to her on the plane. And Dave was doing some laptop, watching something. And Dave woke up. No, no, he didn't. He, Dave stood up. And Rani woke up. Like, like she knew his presence was uh, a calling for her. And I was like, how do you even know that? Oh, yeah, I remember now, yes. Yeah, yeah I'm still, <laughs> I still remember that to this day. It was so clear. Yeah. Now, see, this is what we mean. Now, we can expand this capacity, not only to know about our own partners, but we can also uh, call it tapping into the macrocosmic causal body. Now, this macrocosmic causal body is nothing but infinite potential, as I explained already, in, uh, in uh, unmanifest that is yet to manifest, right? Now, it's going to manifest one way or the other. However, it won't manifest exactly as was determined or as was supposed to happen. Why? Because there's constantly intermediary causes contributing and there's also immediate causes. However, in some cases, when those intermediary and immediate causes are not strong enough to offset that which is about to happen, then that trajectory continues as prophesied originally. Therefore, some things in prophecies 
get fulfilled and some things don't. Because why? From the macro, from the, from the much bigger picture, you're not going to change the trajectory of a meteor coming towards the earth. In that case, if you prophes prophesize that the meteor is going to come in 20 years, that is going to happen, right? Because we're not involved. We're not doing anything to the meteor to offset it. But in terms of earth, it gets a lot more complicated because we are constantly uh, modifying each other's results, right? So therefore the prophecies on earth are uh, sometimes do come true and sometimes don't come true on the basis of our interception of these, uh, these uh, uh, possibilities that we are ourselves collapsing through our choices. Hey, Rani, did the book say when this corona will end? <laughs> Sorry, in the prediction book, yes, yeah. it'll yeah, fade away. It says it'll fade away by uh, next year. It'll yeah, fade away. Fade it'll fade away this fade year, away. end of the year, but it'll fade, continue fading away. There will still be viruses around, but um, it won't be as effective. Well, I mean, so that's a hope for all of us. <laughs> and wasn't it coming back in 2030? It's coming back in 10 years' time. It's repeating yeah. again. The I same coronavirus. Okay. According to this book, yeah, not according to me. I can pause the classes in the right time next time, be more effective in management of our classes. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> May I ask one last question? Sorry. Yes. Sorry, Andre. Um, so would that mean that some karmas don't plan out maybe as to the extent that they should? Um, yeah. Just... It does? Okay. Yeah, true. So some karmas do not. That's why you can go to a tarot card reader and they say you're going to get married. Now you walk out and you trip yourself, you, you, you break your head and you end up in a hospital. Because of that, you're not going to meet your lover. So you, now you're not going to get married. <laughs> you might meet it in the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you might meet it in the hospital. <laughs> so what I mean is, uh, and not only did you slip because, okay, why did you slip? Because some irresponsible child left a banana peel on the floor, right? So we had no control over that. So this is what I mean. Intermediary causes are constantly modifying that which is, quote, prophesized. So we cannot rely on these prophecies because too many variables are intercepting. But what happens if you fall in love with the doctor that's uh, doing the surgery on you? Yeah, in that case, see, now we're going to justify, go, oh, that, prof that, that person who prophesied was correct. You know, this was supposed to happen. But you actually don't know whether, you know, whether this is a, a new cause as a result of the banana peel or, you know, it's, uh, or it's, it's not related to the tarot card at all. Right? So again, what I'm saying is our tendency is to create a, a, a I'm going to use this chat, a, a final destination or a final conclusion to everything that happens to us. The point is we don't know because I'm gonna talk about next week, the only entity entity that knows all is Ishwara with all knowledge, all power. And we're gonna talk about Ishwara next week and Draupadi is disrobing and the past causes of past life. Okay. Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha, Sarve Santu Niramayaha, Sarve Padrani Pashyantu. Mm -hmm.